Well, good morning. It's Breakfast with the Broker every Tuesday at 9 a.m. We do have a special guest, but before we talk about the special guest, you know, I got to tell you, you know, we originally get, did this uh, program over two years ago, almost two and a half years ago. And what we've done is our objective was always to perpetuate prof- professionalism and collaborate with the industry. So I encourage you uh, in the next, uh, uh, the fourth quarter as, we, uh, as we're in it, um, to really uh, reach out to your colleagues, your peers, uh, those people in the real estate industry, see how they're doing, talk to them, you know, um, and, and really collaborate, you know, because we're not competitive. You know, I mean, we might be competitive in, in, in nature, but we're not competitive in, in actuality or practicality because, you know, there, there's a lot of business, obviously. And we have a lot of, uh, you know, um, sphere of influence and such. So I, I encourage each and every one of you as a viewership um, to really reach out to each other um, and collaborate going forward. So without further ado, and now by way of Longboat Key, Florida. He is the former vice president of business development at our at Remax LLC. He's the chief development officer at We Insure Group. Phil Vasali, the CEO of We Insure, calls our next guest as a brand builder. He is a gator, a bull. He is Chris Fluger. Woo! I tell you what, that's a hell of an intro right there. We might want to call it now. It's so good. <laughs> So what's going on? How are you? I appreciate that. That's uh, like I said. That's that's a hell of an intro, and I hope I live up to this. This is now. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure you are. I mean, you know, we've uh, got to know each other over the years, uh, obviously through the uh, Remax Network and Remax HQ. And um, as you transitioned into uh, We Insure, you know, there, you know, you're so very well respected in the real estate industry. Um, you know, because insurance kind of goes hand in hand with that. And uh, tell us a little bit about how the transition has been and, um, you know, why did you make the move? That's a great question. So, you know, obviously I had been I had been with headquarters for about 11 years. And, you know, my first two years, I worked directly, you know, for for Dave Linegar in his own operation. So he had about 42 offices across four states. And so my job was thrown right in there in the beginning, being a licensed agent coming aboard. Uh, is to really manage those offices. So I got to see a lot of behind the scenes. And so I'm, I'm kind of working on your side at that point, right? So when that happened, uh, of course, it was 2007, dropped down to 2009, you know, and that was not a great time. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What happened in 2009? I, I'm, not, I'm not 100% sure, but I remember September 2008 like it was yesterday. Oh, it was so painful. But um, I can tell you that was the best learning experience I could ever have. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't my own personal offices, so I, I would thank Dave for continuing to operate. Um, but uh, it really, it really taught me a lot of things about how the inner workings of a brokerage, you know, really what really happens behind the scenes uh, from recruiting, retention, space. You know, what's the most important things? What's what's the best part about Remax, right? What's the best value props that are out there? So um, I got a lot of experience in that. Worked across multiple different regions, and like I said, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I did international trainings and. You know, I love I love sales. So, you know, for me, it was it was an opportunity. I got to a growth point where I thought to myself, "Hey, I've done a lot here." You know, when you get past ten years with somewhere, you're like, "I've done a lot." And while I loved everybody there, I think it was time for me to kind of grow and expand. And so, the transition for me was more, you know, working with other franchise brands as opposed to just just in real estate, just to see what else you know I could do and what else was going on, just to my own personal growth experience. So, I worked with like six or seven different brands. And lo and behold, this came up. Uh, you, know, you probably remember Mr. Pete Crow. He uh, he called me one day and said, "Hey, man, we should look at this other company in Jacksonville, Florida." And so we did. And at the end of the day, it was a small company uh, by Remax standards. However, it would already had ninety units, and it was all in the state of Florida. And it was just one of those things where I went down, I went through a checklist, and said, "Okay, is the brand there? You know, is it?" Is the team in place? Is the foundation there? And what kind of services do they offer? And it was just such a perfect fit, hand in glove, let's be honest, with with real estate that I thought, why don't more people have it? And so um, one of our owners on the Remax side on the West Coast actually owned a We Insure as part of their of their Remax. And I thought, you know, 
when I talked to the Duncan duo and they said it was the best thing I've ever seen. And I was still surprised. Uh, yeah. I wanted to know why. And they explained it to me and the light bulb, bink, you know, so that's what happened is, you know, I, we joined full time and, you know, we've been working with, uh, with We Insured to expand it. Now we're in 10 states um, and it's growing uh, quite rapidly. So we're very excited. That's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations on the move. And, uh, you know, um, as we've talked and, you know, before is, you know, broker profitability is, 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 uh, is really a kind of difficult these days. Um, you know, uh, you have all the pressure of all the different brands, all the real estate companies, real estate agents wanting different things and, and percentages and higher splits and lower fees and all of that, right? So, you know, most people have looked towards, you know, ancillary services to make up, um, you know, a portion of that or, or, you know, to increase the broker profitability. What is um, something that you think, you know, you know, why is it changed, I guess, broker profitability? And, and, you know, what are you looking forward to the future when it comes to broker profitability? Well, I, I'm uh, sure in most instances, we all realize that margins are being squeezed across the board because it's a hyper competitive market and everybody wants to be associated with it. Um, there's not a huge margin in, in, in running a brokerage in the first place. Um, so it has to be quite, you have to have quite a few people in, in, in there. Um, a lot of it has to do with, you know, the pride in ownership. Um, you know, being you know proud of your brand, being a brand ambassador, but uh, you know you do it well and you can make a good living at it. But in order to do that, you really have to become a one-stop shop. And the expectations, both from clients and from agents, is they can find all this stuff in one place. And nowadays, they expect the you know the broker to vet a lot of the offerings that are out there and make it convenient. And so, if it's convenient, it's it's usable and it's available to them. They will use it, of course. So. For me, I expect I expect the margins to, you know, not necessarily to get any better, you know, going forward because of the way the market operates. However, good brands, good brokers will always succeed because they find a way and people are attracted to working, you know, with the brand and with a broker. Yeah. So, but you know, buyers' uh, behaviors have certainly changed during uh, quarantine and, and such. And, and when you look at a buyer behavior, you know, people don't mind overspending for homes that have, you know, already done, Right. They don't have to, they come in with their toothbrushes, as they used to say. And, you know, they're all upgraded and the whites and grays and moderns and stuff like that. So I guess it's kind of similar when you talk about easy and convenient, you know, when one stop shop, you know, they're more likely to, when they trust a real estate professional, they're more likely to use that service. Um, and, you know, which helps increase broker profitability, but it does a, a couple of things because it gives you leverage as an agent, you know, the, the heart, the, most difficult thing to do is to make sure that a transaction is smooth. And, you know, the more people that you have somewhat some leverage or some degree of control, um, you know, the more likely that that transaction will be a lot smoother. Well, it, is, it, it helps you 100 percent on that side. The control is really there. It's also convenient. So if you can walk into, you know, your office and have a question answered by, a title person or an, a, you know, a mortgage person or an insurance person that also shows that as a brokerage, you know, you're also large enough to have all of these things and your broker has thought through the process of adding different services for you to make it convenient. But it also gives you, you know, amount of uh, credibility as an agent to come back and say, listen, I can ask my guy. And sure. my guy is not just some guy. My guy is the guy that, you know, we have here every day. We can ask that question, walk down the hall and get it answered. And that's 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 a degree of professionalism that people you know prefer these days, and your expectations from your clients. So um, I always liken it to a car dealership, right? You don't walk into the Mercedes dealership and they say, "Why don't you go back to Wells Fargo, take two or three weeks, fill out all the forms, get the retail, you know, get retail money, come back, and then we'll sell you a car," because they would sell this many cars, right? So they right. were they figured it out 40 years ago. Hey, let's just put it in the back. And that way, everybody has, you know, it's convenient. You don't have to take it, but they figured out a way to get wholesale money in there, offer you everything under the sun, and it helps operate the broker, uh, excuse me, the, the auto dealership. But most of their money is made in finance and in service now, not on cars. And so they had right. a way to make that happen. So it's still, you still want a professional you know, uh, operation going at any level. But at the end of the day, they know where their money is made. And really, it's a convenience for all the salespeople that work there. They know the process. They control the deals they go through, and they know they're going to get paid right afterwards. So it makes it convenient for the consumer. It makes it convenient for the, the salespeople. I mean, it's, it's a win-win-win. So, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, you know, staying on the broker topic, uh, you know, our biggest, you know, 
you know, they talk about, you know, recruit, retain, develop, right? Um, so, you know, what, you know, what can a broker do in order to, in this hyper competitive market, in order to recruit agents to their brand? I mean, what, 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 what do you think the single most, you know, thing that a, a broker can do to really help the, you know, uh, increase their, you know, recruiting? You know, a lot of it comes down to likability, right? So people always say there's this they're saying that, you know, people join a brand, but they leave a broker. And so it's it's re-recruiting your existing agents, obviously from a retention perspective, but it's also reminding them, you know, in that process, but also being likable. You know, at the end of at the end of any day, right? If if someone likes you and they can save a nickel going somewhere else, but they don't want to leave working with you on a daily basis, that's the key. Now, if your services fall behind and you know you're just offering one thing, or you know that that falls behind, the perception is you're you're antiquated. Then, no matter how much they like you, they're going to have to make a decision for their business. But if you're offering everything out there and you're being proactive and bringing that education, you know, continuing to to really, you know, teach everybody and mentor people and help them work their deals, why would they leave? So it's yeah. it's it's being likable, but it's also being that mentor and you know, everybody needs it. You know, you, you can't go online, you know, you can go online and order a car, you can go online and order your groceries, but this is not a commodity, right? This is a, this is a mentor mentee relationship, frankly, that people even at any level need a coach. So they still want to come to you for a deal. They still want to be able to get advice as you're working through something. Hey, you know, can you make a call to the other broker because something's falling apart on this deal? Um, they need you to make those deals happen. And if you're there for them, then they'll never leave you. I thought the jerk always wins. <laughs> maybe in some of the negotiations, but not in that. You know, I don't know. I see. A, I see a lot of jerks in our real estate business that win is winning right now. <laughs> What's well, up, market? It's always good enough, market, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Well, sort of not. To me, but, um, <laughs> so uh, now, now we talked about brokers. You know, um, you know what? What are we looking at from an agent perspective? What value? in 2020 and, and going forward, you know, are the agents going to be looking for, are they going to be looking for, you know, um, you know, how are they going to attract business? You know, um, are the online portals the way to go, those kind of things, or, you know, are you lead generating different in different ways? You are, you know, a lot less people will sit there and say, Hey, I've got a referral from a friend of mine, asked him who to go with. Um, you see fewer and fewer people doing that. More people are saying I'd like to be anonymous and just, go you know, find something online and not have to worry about the inner the relationship component. Um, so that is that is a bit perplexing from a, a broker perspective and from an agent perspective. But, you know, everybody has access to the same things. So if it were me and I'm an agent starting out or even an agent operating today, I'm going to get really good at lead conversion. I'm going to make sure that I have all my touch points pre-thought. I'm going to have my drip campaigns in place. I might be using BombBomb for an immediate response so people see my face. Um, I've seen a lot of good, you know, response to that because people now identify you as an actual person and they feel like someone's already working for them. So if you're the first person in and you've got a video behind it, uh, you're likely to get that client. And so that's to me, there's a lot of, you know, there's not really tricks to the trade. It's just good agent practices. And, you know, it's, it's blocking and tackling. You know, you're doing the right things all the time, but I would get really good at lead conversion. That's great. Yeah. And, uh, what is, uh, you know, I mean, obviously we all know what lead conversion is, but, you know, what, you know, g give us maybe a couple tips on um, how to convert those leads, um, you know, and then going on to a second part of the question is, you know, these online portals are really, um, you know, are they doing a disservice to the consumer? You know, are these consumers that do want to remain somewhat anonymous, you know, are they being serviced at a high level? Well, you see, uh, I've made some calls on property and all of a sudden I have the sign saying, call us here. And I pick up the phone call and I think I'm going to talk to you know an owner or at least the other agent. And I get transferred to a switchboard that says, let me get you somebody. And it's six minutes online waiting for someone to pick up the phone. Naturally, I'm hanging up. You know, it's not it's a bad experience. And so if it's not a good experience, don't have an experience at all. Right. They'd rather just wait till the next day and get an email or something. And so that's what I see is a lot of times, you know, when you get these in, in, in practice, they don't work as the way they should. And it actually is a, a turnoff for the client. The other thing right. is 
I may look at 16 properties around here and still go back to the guy I've been working with, you know, for two years. I'm just, I'm out there shopping. So that's one thing, you know, the buyer beware, you know, when you're buying leads offline, um, you, you have to realize they may already have someone. They're not explaining. I don't need to give you my life story on, on first call. You're just talking about the property and I was just calling about the property. I'm inquiring. I may have a full team behind me already. If I'm an investor, I have a full team and thanks for showing it to me, but I'm going to go with my team. And so that's, that's the thing that, you know, a lot of folks don't realize, but building those relationships and, and getting good at that lead conversion, being able to weed through all that, that's, that's your key. Um, but again, in practice, not everything works the way it should. And, you know, getting a hold of those folks and then, you know, being the best that you can be. Um, the number one thing I hear is complaints from anybody about real estate is communication. It's either timely communication or lack of any kind of communication. And so I'd rather hear that things aren't working or my listing is overpriced or I had six people in a month and I should have had 30 uh, or you know, whatever it might be. Hey, knock out the kitchen, paint the house, whatever it might be that I need to do. Uh, I'd rather hear that up front than, you know, just wait. And, you know, the agent's not strong enough to tell me right in the beginning, this is what you're going to need to do. So lack of communication is the number one problem. Yeah, you got, you got to manage a client's expectations or buyers and sellers' expectations and, and letting them know that, you know, you do have a system. You do have a proven system that gets, you know, um, you know the, the job done or achieved, what, you know, essentially. You know, um, we're, we're going to get into two controversial topics. So um, I'll go with the first one. I don't know if you saw the uh, uh, National Association of Realtors. Um, uh, there was uh, basically, um, the, you know, Sherman Antitrust. Um, it, you know, the, one of the sellers is claiming or trying to do a class action lawsuit with with NAR and, and several other companies. Um, you know, and I don't know if you can speak to this or not, but, you know, I'm just asking in general, you know, um, what was concerning to me was the comments from the judge that basically said, listen, you know, this, uh, you know, this case does not, can't be dismissed. And, you know, these are the reasons why. Um, I don't know if you read the report or not, because um, I, I didn't even kind of prep you for this. But uh, um, if you if you didn't, don't worry about it. But uh, um, do you know a, a little bit about the case and, and what's going on? Unfortunately, I had not read. I had not read it. I heard it through the, the process yet, so I couldn't speak to it intelligently. But um, if, if I if I gather the meaning, it looks like they're trying to say that this is a this is a you know an antitrust issue, having all realtors represent you know both sides of the deal. Is that yeah, basically, it's an offer of compensation. Um, they're going after um, you know real estate commissions and the standard of that. Um, so um, seller got I guess annoyed or whatever, and 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 and. Um, the lawyers that are involved have, have been, you know, are very highly successful class action lawsuit lawyers um, who are going after the real estate commissions and saying that the commission should be negotiable, which it always is negotiable. But uh, they're saying because the MOS, because the National Association of Realtors um, has the rules in place, it um, kind of favors the um because of the offer of compensation required um to be in the mos it, it kind of favors um that the seller has to pay it because the the listing broker is paying it so you know they're they're suing for uh, millions and millions of dollars and whatever like that um but um you know i'm gonna i'm gonna read this in minor just just kind of quickly uh sure, I don't sure. Need to do this but it was um what was concerning to me was um, the comments, you know, by the judge, um, basically, um, uh, hold on one second, I'm doing off the cuff, <laughs> at least I know where to get it, sort of, um, I just wanted to, you know, I don't want to paraphrase her comments, but, um, uh, basically says, it, and it's from Inman article that, uh, Inman, uh, posted, it said, in denying motion to dismiss, Judge Andrea would argue that the plaintiffs would have paid substantially lower commissions if not for the buyer broker commission rules. And the rules have created an artificial inflation of commission rates. In sum, plaintiffs' allegations plausibly show that the buyer broker commission rules prevent effective negotiation over commission rates and cause an artificial inflation of buyer broker commission rates in the markets served by the multiple listing services identified in the lawsuit complaint. Wood ruling reads, thus plaintiff's allegations are sufficient to survive dismissal under the rule of reason analysis. 
you know, obviously there's a discovery and, and such, and, um, and, you know, I, I'm extremely biased, but um, that being said is, you know, the very standard of practice that a real estate professional is, is, is working on is being somewhat targeted and or, you know, effective. And, um, you know, you know, I, I mean, I, speaking on, uh, on behalf of only David Searle and no one else, not Remax, not any of the boards or anything like that that I'm involved in, you know, it's just, it, it's concerning that um, a seller would think that you can't negotiate or that you are artificially inflated because it really it's a competitive environment. It you know, you have the opportunity to um, what, sell it yourself. You know, um, you have flat fee companies. You have all kinds of different companies. And quite honestly, MOS gives it out to more people. I mean, still 91% of all um, listings are sold, you know, off the uh, multiple listing service. So it's uh, just concerning. Well, my, my two cents is obviously, you know, I'm, I'm still a licensed agent in Colorado. And uh, so I'm also biased. But I would tell you that, you know, you mentioned everything on there. You know, you have the ability to do it yourself. You don't have to pay anything. You can list it yourself and offer to pay you know, one side of the transaction, there's other ways to do it. You probably be very unsuccessful in that process. And that's why most people don't. Right. So that's, that's the thing you want the service because you want the highest price. Uh, to me, it sounds a little sour grapes. I don't know the, you know, the, the situation. yeah, I don't, I, you know, I, I mean, I'm not privy to the, obviously the conversations or any of the details, you know, fall, you know, in the, in the lawsuit, but um, I was just shocked by the judge's comments. And I wasn't shocked that the judge, um, allow the lawsuit to, to carry on because they normally do allow it. They don't, really, you know, dismiss uh, lawsuits if they have any kind of degree of merit. But, you know, it was uh, it was just shocking. The, the comments, I guess, um, was concerning to us. And I can imagine. Um, I, I would say that, uh, you know, you, like you said, you have choice out there anyway. So it's really right. up to you. And I think maybe they just want to hear it. And, you know, the fact that we can defend all of those the aspects of it, it seems like it may be actually beneficial long term to have something come up and be squashed, you know, with a good yeah. process. So it may be just an opportunity for people to hear exactly how much work goes into the profession of real estate as opposed to, you know, people think, well, I listed and it's sold in two days. Why do I have to pay you so much? Um, right. If it's sold in a year and a half, you'd still pay me the same. And I, you know, it's, it's, you know, they just, at some point, you're like, wow, it seemed like a lot, but you got more than you expected. We sold it quickly. We, you know, you got to move on and people ignore that piece because they just, you know, they get cheap at some point. So. Sure. I mean, statistics are on our, uh, certainly on our side because, um, you know, statistically it shows a significant increase in appreciation by, you know, having a, being part of the MOS, but also, you know, selling it on the MOS versus a for sale by owner and those kind of things. So, you know, we're, um, you know, I'm confident, but you know, um, it was just a little more concerning. So on to another, uh, Controversial topic, I guess I would say. Um, Zillow. So, um, you know, Zillow came out and, you know, in 2017 basically said, hey, um, we're not ever going to be a brokerage. We're not going to be a brokerage. We're not going to be a brokerage. We're not going to be a brokerage. Guess what? 2020 came and now we're a brokerage. Um, you know, how does that affect um, agents? And, you know, I, and I'm not asking, I'm not really, well, I may not ask you, but, <laughs> um, you know, sh- should realtors be worried and are they, you know, feeding the beast by kind of, you know, paying for a premier agent and, and paying for Zillow and offers and all these different things that they're doing? You know, that's the question. That, that's, been, that's been a question for, for years at this point. You know, what, what, what do we expect and, you know, will they ever go down this road? And I, you know, from internal conversations, what's your, you know, I can't really share, you know, we always had the expectation that it would come to this at some point. Sure. And, you know, it's a competitive environment. So you knew that at some point it would come in there. However, you know, people still need that touch, right? They still need the agents. And again, you know, we go back to the car analogies. Not everybody drives one brand of car. Not everyone goes, you know, for one, everything. Not everyone takes the bus, right? So it, it really gives you the opportunity to have some variety out there. Uh, you know, Redfin's been around for a while and they've not dominated the market. You know, the, those those transaction numbers do not, you know, sh- you know, scream, oh my gosh, it's all over for realtors, right? It just, it just says there's a different model out there. And so right. I would say, you know, you got to go where the eyeballs are. And as an agent, if you're successful doing that, you're not going to change your model, um, whether they're going to the business or not. 
they'll go into pockets where they think they can be successful and they'll be competitive. Um, but they have money to throw at it. The question is, will they want to continue to go down that road if ad revenue drops, right? If they're, if they're, if the revenue on their side drops from different realtors, will they continue to go down that road and will they see any success? These are still unknowns, you know, as we go through. So I would say there's a, it's, it's good to watch, but you know, a high degree, degree of concern, probably not yet. And yeah. I mean, I look at competition as, as really being a positive, you know, the more uh, different models and the, is, you know, I think it's the easier way to differentiate yourself from all of them. Right. So, you know, if you're about building relationships and, 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 you know, servicing your customers at a high level, um, you know, you certainly are going to stand above the crowd, you know, and, and stand above, you know, Zillow's and stuff like that. And, you know, and I, you know, quite honestly, I look at Zillow and say, all right, well, you're an accurate in estimates. You uh, deceive the public with, uh, um, you know, what perceived to be what pub most public thinks that they're calling a listing agent when they're calling a, you know, premier agent. You know, you're doing all these different things and saying, you know what, um, I'm not going to be a brokerage. Now I am a brokerage. Uh, I'm not going to sell your data in dot loop. Um, well, now I am in, unless you opt out. You know, so all these different things and actions speak louder than words. And then this isn't Chris Pfluger speaking. This is David Searle. But, you know, I just think like, you know, why would I ever want to back a company that is deceptive in, in, in you know, at least in my eyes, you know, in, in their practices? and um, you know, so uh, I I've, I kind of stopped it. I'm not encouraging other people to stop it. It's just against my culture and, and my mindset, um, you know, going forward. Not because I don't welcome competition, because I certainly think the more competition, the better. The more people talking about the real estate market, the better. And, um, you know, and we'll continue to do our thing. And, um, you know, we're not, um, you know, um, we're not oblivious to things that are going on, but we we're very confident in the way we react to situations and we're very confident in, you know, the way we help and build our communities and participate um, in our communities and build these relationships that are, you know, you know, significantly more sustainable than the shiny object. <laughs> well, we, we all know it's very, very difficult. It's, you know, it's interesting in practice and, and theory to say we can do this. But actually, you know, putting it in play and actually executing on that is very difficult. And so, you know, I think and that's why I said there's there's not a, a high degree of control at this time because you know, we've never seen anybody execute on a national scale basis well from any brand at any point, right? It's it's just very difficult to manage that because real estate is hyper local. And sure. it's just it's just like, you know, any kind of eye buying program. You know, it's really good when you have a homogenous you know, area that has 62% or 30% or something of, of new homes are all built between this time. They all are square boxes that look like X. But if you move into other markets like, you know, Boston, and they're all built, in, you know, 100 years ago, and then this one was built last week, how do you apply a model to it? So very similar to, you know, my industry now in, in insurance. You know, if you, well, what's going to happen to insurance? Can I just go online and call that little gecko and he's going to give me the price and that's it? And the answer is, in some cases, yes. Um, but I've had instances myself, you know, on, on auto where, you know, one of my kids decides to purchase, you know, her own insurance and then gets back and has an accident, and realize I don't have the right coverage because it was cheap. Well, if you have nobody to consult with, you have no, you know, no one to blame. You have nothing to do other than I got the cheapest insurance possible. And frankly, right. if you slap a VIN number on the side of a house, every home is different. So every time you go online, it's 100% wrong. You have 100% of the time it's going to be wrong. So it has to be you know, adjusted for by a professional and you want someone to give you advice. What do I really need versus the cheapest thing I could possibly get? You get the cheapest thing and you have a hurricane come through or flooding or hail damage and you decide to opt out for wind and uh-oh, you know, then you're in, you know, in the hole for 30 grand. That's something that not every American wants to do, right? It's, it's coming to pocket 30,000 nor can they afford to. So yeah, no. it's one of those no, great. Just like yeah, I mean, you have a, a professional consultant to help you through the process and buying a home and selling a home, I wouldn't want to leave it to an online portal myself. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I, don't, I don't want robot robot Andy to come in and uh, <laughs> show the homes or whatever. Right. So, um, uh, Chris, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, you know, I do want to. Uh, I always ask the last two questions. Sure. Um, sure. So, um, what is your favorite streaming? series like Netflix or Hulu or whatever. Um, and what are you currently watching? Wow. Um, favorite, uh, I'm going to skip over because I'm currently watching Cobra Kai. 
Yeah, I love that. It was fun. And I wait for someone to tell me what to watch next. But uh, I have, I would, I can't say that I have a, a favorite. I've watched The Sopranos more than once. Uh, I've watched uh, Justified more than once. I've watched a few other shows like that. But uh, Cobra Kai is my current, well, my wife tells me what I'm watching. So my wife said, currently I'm watching Cobra Kai. So, <laughs> so uh, I got a recommendation. Um, uh, it's called Kingdom. Kingdom. Um, yeah, it's on Netflix. It's a... Uh, it's about a MMA um, uh, fighter, but it's not. It's not just about that. It's just the, the stories are great. Characters, the acting is excellent. Um, uh, it's a little bit long. It's three seasons, but I think they're like fifteen to twenty episodes each. But they're uh, it's phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. I'll definitely take a look. Thanks. And I appreciate you having me on today for sure. No, this is awesome. I mean, Chris. I mean, you know, for those uh, brokers out there and broker owners out there that are uh, looking to increase their broker profitability and their ancillary service suites uh, for that one-stop shop as we discussed you know definitely reach out to chris fluger um he uh he's a wealth of information but you know he gives you you know the real stuff um you know it, it's not a uh, sales job to him it's building relationships and uh, we certainly appreciate chris and and we ensure and, and all those different things that he's doing uh for the real estate industry so very much appreciate Chris. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, true, you know, we uh, we strive to make it easy. It was always difficult to get insurance before, and now it's it truly is a turnkey model that allows you to get in very simply and easily. And you know, we're here to answer any questions. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. We have a lot of questions all the time, but uh, happy to answer any of those. And we've got, uh, like I said, we're growing in all the states. Just uh, right now, we're in ten, and we're looking to to expand. I'd imagine two or three more this year. And 2021 should be even even more explosive. So very excited. Awesome. awesome. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Breakfast with the broker every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Um, I believe next week are we, we next week we might actually be doing a on the road breakfast. I have to check with Alex Reichenbach. But before we leave, we do have to say happy birthday to our director of marketing, our Breakfast with the Broker producer, Alex Reichenbach. So we certainly uh, want to wish her a very happy birthday. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Thanks, Chris. And we'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you.